la gloria de colui che tutto muove, per l'universo penetra e risplenda in una parte più e meno altrove. The glory of him who moveth everything, he tells us, penetrates all the universe and shines more brightly in one part and elsewhere less. So begins the final canticle of Dante's Divina Commedia. Within the heaven which most receives his light, I was, he continues, and saw what he who thence descends neither knows how nor hath the power to tell. For as it draweth near to its desire, our intellect so deeply sinks therein that recollection cannot follow it. As much, however, of the holy realm as in my memory I could treasure up shall now become the subject of my song. The resulting canticle, writes Helen Luke, is a testament to the success of Dante's venture. What we are listening to, she writes, is not only some of the most glorious poetry ever written, but to a story, the story of an ordinary flesh and blood person like ourselves whose human love grows and expands into divinity, deepens and contracts to a single point, so that his whole being is drawn, as if by a magnet, to the vision of God. Don't follow just for the poetry, Dante cautions at the start, and do not think to follow with the intellect alone, no. For the realms ahead lay far beyond this mortal world, this planet, this dimension we call our home. Dante will become a psychonaut, so to speak, travelling through uncharted inner space by way of deepest transformation, illumination, transhumanization, as he will call it, toward unity within a sublime mystery at the heart of the cosmos. So turn back, turn back, lest you are part of the few, he warns, who early raised your necks for angel's bread, on which one here on earth subsists but with which none are ever sated. Ye may well start your vessel on the deep salt sea, in the furrow of my ship. Stay close, he counsels, for by losing sight of me, you may so easily be left astray. Such important advice, says Helen Luke, for in setting forth beyond the known world, we must surely stay connected to our inner guidance, lest we lose our way completely. Dante was so clearly a mystic, and his work, though flawed, as all art is ultimately flawed, as it makes its transition into the temporal world, the Commedia is nonetheless a record of a mystical revelation, and as such transcends its day and culture to reveal universal truths as relevant now as they were then. It is as if Dante is plugged into the motherboard, so to speak, that he is sharing with us a vast download not normally available to the earth-bound mind. And it is unbelievable, writes Luke, that he could have written his account without experiencing, however briefly, a mystical revelation. It is a view that many commentators share. Now the light of which he speaks, that illuminates the entire universe, is the sublime light of consciousness, of pure
pure love. It is a sentient light, all-knowing, all-forgiving, and utterly sublime. To go beyond humanity is not to be told in words, Dante tells us. Grace alone may allow the experience. He is like Glaucus, he tells us, the character from Greek myth who ate a rare herb and became like a god of the sea. He is like the Apostle Paul, who in the second letter to the Corinthians wrote that he had not known if he was in his body or beyond it when he was swept up on waves of ecstasy into the third heaven, a categorization understood in medieval cosmology denoting a state of consciousness beyond the literal, the earthbound, beyond even the imagination, the metaphorical and symbolic, to a transcendent metaphysical reality in which heaven is glimpsed and the world is perceived subspecie eternitatis, to use the Latin phrase, meaning under the aspect of eternity, from the perspective of eternity. Dante too has experienced infinity, says Giuseppe Mazotta in his Yale University lecture on the Paradiso. He has been overwhelmed with the spectacle of things that dwarf the mind. How then can he communicate this experience to us here upon the earth with only finite tools at his disposal? It is impossibile, as the Italians might say. Dante the poet begs the assistance of the great god Apollo to guide his mortal quill, to put his treasure into words, into poetry, into song, as he says at the start. Now, the structure of the Paradiso is based upon the four cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, and the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, believed to correspond with the celestial chakras positioned above the head. In the verses that follow, Dante will show us his vision in a sequential, linear sense, as he ascends with his beloved to each of the seven planets of the solar system, as it was understood in medieval Ptolemaic cosmology, visiting the moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, the fixed stars, and then onward to the primum mobile and the incorporeal realm of the Empyrean, the heaven of pure light, where he will experience the blissful unity of all. All the souls they will meet along the way dwell with God beyond time in a state of union within the white rose at the heart of the cosmos. The soul's distribution across the planets is a partial illusion, a poetic device, if you like, that enables the reader to look upon the diversity within the unity of the Paradiso. But the reality, the true reality, is one of indivisibility. All time is one time. Our linear spatial experience is part of the third dimension, part of being human, of residing upon the earth. It is as if each of the heavens are petals 
radiating out from the centre of this beautiful rose, like ripples across a still lake, ring upon ring of angelic choirs, ranks of saints and elevated souls emanating from that core, each finding their place, their reflection throughout the heavens and beyond, all the way down to the lower, more dense realms of form, even to Lucifer himself, the great fallen angel at the very pit of the inferno. And each according to their weight, so to speak, according to the speed of their vibration, the highest, most closely encircling the divine, the lowest, the fallen below. There is order in the universe, Dante tells us, symmetry and beauty beyond imagining. The glory of him who moveth everything, Dante told us at the very start, penetrates all the universe and shines more brightly in one part and elsewhere less. It is into this radiant, sentient light that Beatrice now gazes at the start of Canto II. It is noon on the spring equinox, the Wednesday after Easter. The light into which she stares is far too bright for Dante to bear, but he sees it reflected perfectly in her eyes and he beholds the heavens above. Heavenly music then sounds, and together with his beloved, he rises up from the earthly paradise like a great bird. Throughout the Purgatorio, Dante was aware of an increasing desire to fly. Now that desire is realized, his soul is free to soar. Well, the two rise up swiftly, and straight away he understands that everything is different now. They travel by intention alone. There is telepathy too, from the moment they leave the earth realm. Their first port of call is the heaven of the moon, Il Cello della Luna. And upon entering this sphere, Beatrice's eyes become even more radiant and her smile ever more beautiful. It seemed to me that a cloud covered us, Dante tells us, dense, lucid, firm and polished like a diamond struck by sunlight. The eternal pearl accepted us into it as water accepts a ray of light. This sphere of heaven is reserved for those souls who have experienced difficulty in maintaining their vows, here symbolized by the waxing and waning of the moon. Souls contemplate and review their weakness here while simultaneously dwelling in the Empyrean above. We are once more reminded of near-death accounts, where upon leaving the body, the soul finds itself in a realm where, within the context of ineffable love and light, they are presented with a life review, enabling deep understanding of deeds done, love given, as well as pain inflicted. Well, by and by, Dante becomes aware of faint spirits close by. One of them is the beautiful Picarda Donati. She was the sister of Ferese and Corso, who Dante met in the Purgatorio. Picarda, once a nun, tells of how she was abducted from her convent by her brother and forced to marry to procure advantage for her family. 
Dante is initially perplexed. It seems unfair that Picarda now inhabits the lowest sphere of the Paradiso on account of an event over which she had no control. It is the first of many perplexities that Dante will experience as he ascends through the heavens, and each time Beatrice will attempt to enlighten him, to bring him to another level, another octave of understanding that will facilitate his continued journey. Their mode of travel here in the Paradiso is determined not by overcoming obstacles, but literally through the attainment of insight. There is a deeper truth to Picarda's tale, she tells him, and if he could look into her soul, he would soon see that while she resisted outwardly, a small part of her consented, a secret, perhaps not even fully conscious part, that either chose a different path or feared outer consequences more than breaking her vow to God. In this, the lowest sphere of heaven, Picarda has the chance to reflect upon these complexities. Yet remember, though Picarda is here now, Beatrice reminds him, and us, every place in the heavens is paradise. Ogni dove in cielo è paradiso. Dante then questions Beatrice about the nature of vows themselves. God gave us free will, she tells him, the liberty to choose between options. The vows we make before God are sacred, sacrosanct, and may not be broken without consequence. We cannot just go back on these promises, however much we might regret them. Neither can we use our vows to bargain with God in order to achieve our desired goals. This, of course, is a preposterous notion that leads only to hell, as we see clearly in the tragic case of Agamemnon, one of Homer's Greek kings, who promises God he will sacrifice something beautiful if only he will send strong winds to speed his army off to Troy. The winds duly arrive, but then it turns out that the beautiful sacrifice is to be his beloved daughter, Iphigenia. Agamemnon sells away as desired, but his heart is forever broken. Sometimes we may be released from old promises and make new and different vows, but only, only ever, if they bring us into greater alignment with our soul's purpose. The tragedy of Picarda is that her choice took her in the opposite direction, away into the secular world, away from her life with her true beloved, with God. So what might be learnt here? That we must not fool ourselves into believing we are victims of this or that or the other, but we must acknowledge the part we have played in life's dramas, the subtle, most unfathomable ways in which we have become complicit in the orchestration of our personal myth. And understanding, it is suddenly time for Dante and Beatrice to depart. Picarda, he tells, sings sweetly Ave Maria, and singing, vanishes like a heavy weight through deep water. Her song echoes in his mind, until like an arrow that hits the target, 
before the bowstring is still, he tells us, we rose to the second sphere. <laughs> 